Welcome to Perry World House's 2022 Global Shift Colloquium, Islands on the Climate Front Line, Risk and Resilience. We are pleased to see you at this keynote event, The Art of Climate Resilience, a conversation with Kathy Gentle Kitchener, Marshall Lee's poet, performer, educator, and climate envoy. Our event will be moderated today by Bill McKibben, author, activist, and founder of Third Act. I'm gonna start by, in fact, um, introducing Bill, who will then introduce Kathy. He is the founder of Third Act, which organizes people over the age of 60 for action on climate, change, climate and justice. His 1989 book, The End of Nature, is regarded as the first book for a general audience about climate change and has appeared in 24 languages. He's gone on to write 20 books and his work appears regularly in periodicals from The New Yorker to Rolling Stones. He serves as a Schumann Distinguished Scholar in Environmental Studies at Middlebury College, as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he has won the Gandhi Peace Prize as well as honorary degrees from 20 colleges and universities. Bill, the floor is yours to introduce Kathy and begin our program. Thank you. Well, LaShawn, thank you so much. I'm very grateful that you asked me to do this because I can't think of anyone that I would rather introduce and then uh, talk with than my friend Kathy. Um, and uh, I, her accomplishments are many, and I will give you a, a, a more formal description in a minute. But let me say that one of the more memorable weeks of my life was spent in her company, um, lugging uh, uh, packs and sleeping bags and tents up high under the ice sheet in Greenland, in the center of Greenland, probably 100 miles from the nearest person so that uh, uh, she and, and her colleague Akka Niviana could record a truly remarkable poem, Rise, uh, that I hope you will become one of the many hundreds of thousands of people who have watched. Um, it was a memorable poem because, among other things, Kathy was standing on the ice that when it melts, if it melts, if we let it melt, will, um, well, will drown the place where she grew up. Um, uh, uh, and that's about as powerful a statement as there was even before the poem itself, which is a thing of extraordinary power. She is a poet of extraordinary power and has been for a long time, despite the fact that she's not very old. Um, and uh, her started uh, writing um, in, in, in her in her youth and really first came to international global prominence um, in 2014 when she was chosen to address the beginning of the United Nations uh, Climate Summit. And she got up and performed a piece of poetry. Well, uh, look, UN climate summits are not renowned for their, um, for the depth of human feeling that uh, uh, happens there. There are places filled with technical jargon and backroom dealing and uh, on and on and on. It came to a stop for a little while as people tried to cope with what they were hearing and the power of that work. She spoke again at COP21 in Paris, which was the high point of the entire climate negotiations process. She's won award after award after award, and she's got uh, uh, actual degrees of her own, um, uh, 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 um, both from Marshall and from the University of Hawaii in, in Manoa. Um, but I, the, I think the place where I feel perhaps the most kinship with you, Kathy, is the fact that you don't get to write anymore as much as you might like because you've got other duties in the world. Um, Kathy is serving as the climate envoy for the Marshall Islands, uh, which is a, a, an important job because these are uh, the Marshalls, like the other island nations that you've been hearing from earlier today, are the sentinels that are doing their best to alert the rest of the world to what's going on and to demand action. Uh, but she's also co-founder of the uh, environmental nonprofit, I'm going to massacre the pronunciation, I have no doubt, Joe Jicom, uh, which works with Marshallese youth uh, to raise 
awareness and, and take action on climate change there in the Marshall Islands. So as someone who's um, turned away from uh, some of my own writing to do organizing over the years, um, I have some sense of how, that that's a difficult choice to have to make sometimes, but it is a choice that has to be made. And we're extraordinarily grateful to you, Kathy, for making it. So I, I'm, I, I think maybe uh, you're going to um, uh, read us a poem, give us a poem, um, um, uh, at, at, at some point here towards the beginning. And that'd be awfully good because I think, um, I think it would, I think it would settle us and set the, set the mood for the conversation to follow. Thanks so much, Bill. And it's so nice to be in conversation with you again, actually, because, uh, like, you know, like you said, I, I've, uh, the last time was at yeah in greenland i mean what was the last time we saw each other we might have been at another cop where we might have just been greenland yeah but it was really amazing you know it was an amazing time and it's definitely one of my highlights too to be honest it was a great time and i think partially because we weren't there to like speak you know we weren't there to do conferences or anything or coordination we were there to just experience this world and for me greenland was was such a like a tip point tipping point for me to understand how our world is connected in in such a way so um thank you for that and it's always an honor to to speak with you bill um definitely look up to you and your work and your writing as well so um so i think uh i i will just launch into it now um uh i come by way of my position as envoy in a, in a really um unique way because i i went through it as a, a poet you know first i was a poet first and i used that poetry for um, what people would call activism. And I, I was working with 350 Pacific at the same time that I was um, uh, I had at, in front of the UN writing that, performing that piece on poetry. Um, poetry and art, I think, have a real capacity in, uh, for communicating and engaging people in climate change issue that highlights like the gray area of climate change. Like it's such a nuanced and such a, uh, a big topic and sometimes it can get lost in data, it can get lost in figures. And so um, I always have loved poetry and I grew up writing it. And um, I recognize the way in which it engages with um, our oral tradition, which is um, how Marshallese culture is. Marshallese culture is rooted in legends and it's still a very um, thriving oral culture to the point where there's a lot of argument over how to spell a certain word in Marshallese because we don't write it that often. We're still an, an entirely oral culture. Um, and then, you know, for climate change in the context of climate change, um, that language is also rooted very deeply in the land. So we have very, we have over 24 atolls and each of them have their own in different biodiversity. Um, they have their different legends and stories that's attached to that specific land. And so for Marshallese people, we don't call ourselves, I'm Rumayo in front of other Rumayo. We'll say the island we're specifically from. So the island, I, if, if this was a, a, a Marshallese audience, I would normally say, you know, my um, Joey is Rumai, my clan. And then I would say the islands I'm from, I'm like, you know, and um, I'm trying to remember all my islands. There's a lot of islands. So, you know, you, you actually say those islands because that's how you're defined. And so when you're talking about sea level rise for a country like that, you know, where we're only two meters above sea level, there's no higher ground to go to. We're one of three atoll nations in the world. Um, you're really talking about not just the loss of a physical existence of land because of that rising sea level. You're talking about the loss of, of culture. You're talking about thousands of years of stories and and proverbs and chants and songs that's attached to specific sites of land so i see that even in the work that i do with jojigum with our nonprofit on climate change um, we actually have a, a project that's ongoing right now where we're building kiosks um, at legendary landmark sites so on this island Mejuro, um, there's like maybe seven specific sites that have legends attached to them 
And what we're doing is we're building these kiosks at those sites so people know this is where this legend took place. And to engage youth on it, we're actually teaching them those legends and they're painting legends, their own interpretations of the legends and attaching it to the kiosks. And this is an effort to, you know, um, so that people will actually know those legends because a lot of people don't know it actually, even Marsha's people ourselves, like I don't know all the specific legends that are attached. So, um, you know, so that as we're talking about climate change, that's what's being affected, you know, is, is these sites of legends where, you know, that are really important to who we are as a people. And I think that can be really difficult for people to understand if, if they don't have that rooted culture that's attached to land, you know, that kind of attachment. And so that's what we try to engage with. And that's what we try to promote when we are working at these international engagement levels. We're talking about loss and damage. You know, what is irreversible loss? We talk about the finance, you know, um, of, of, of physical loss of houses or physical loss of that, of um, coastlines. But how do we put a price tag on the loss of cultural knowledge that's attached to that reef? So that's a part of a lot of the work that I do. And um, I think uh, it was a really interesting kind of journey to get to where I am now. And, you know, Envoy is not at all a, a high level, as high level of a position. It depends on where you go. Um, it's a new position for the Marshall Islands, to be honest. We have ambassadors, but me and my fellow Envoy, Tina Stege, who's based in New York, you know, we're just beginning to navigate uh, what these roles are. Um, and so moving from performing at an event to now being in the negotiating room is, and then also being, you know, meeting with other, with diplomats and trying to um, engage with them on the, on the specific issues that we're, you know, trying to highlight at the COP or at, you know, these UN conferences. Um, that's a very, it's still very, it's very different. You know, it, it is very different. And some, at times, at certain times it can, it can be really difficult because you know it's a fine line of engaging your emotions and also being gracious about it you know and so um the poem that i was going to read was about uh that kind of fine line um it's something that i call a uh, nice voice so you know despite uh what these difficulties there she is <laughs> sorry everybody <laughs> <laughs> It's, so what, it's just what? like just like rural Vermont, Kathy. The, the internet is. Uh, uh, yeah, it's for some reason whenever it rains, the Wi-Fi. Is kind of, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Oh, so I, where did I cut off? Actually, did you guys catch it? Yes, you you were just talking about the um, how odd it was sometimes to uh, now be in the room not as the poet but as the. Uh, negotiator and yeah. how it took a different skill set. Yeah, so luckily poetry lets me kind of process those different areas. And so um, uh, the what I'm going to read is actually sort of, uh, in, it was a reflection after I had started that work. So I'll just dive into it before and hopefully cross my fingers that the Wi-Fi doesn't drop out again. There you go. So it's called Nice Voice. When my daughter whines, I tell her, Say what you want in a nice voice. My nice voice is reserved for meetings with a view. My palm outstretched saying, here are our problems. Legacies rolling out like multicolored marbles. Don't focus so much on the doom and gloom, they keep saying. We don't want to depress everyone. This is only our survival. We rely heavily on foreign aid, I am instructed to say. I am instructed to point out the need for funds to build islands, move families from Wado to Wado, my mouth a shovel to spade the concrete with, but I am just pointing out neediness. So needy, these small underdeveloped countries. I feel myself shrinking in the back of the taxi when a diplomat compliments me. How brave for admitting it so openly. The allure of global negotiations dulls like the back of a worn spoon. I lose myself easily in a gamin, a Marshallese traditional ceremony. Gamin defined as feast, a celebration. A baby's breath endures their first year, so we pack hundreds of close bodies under tents lined up for plates I pass to my cousin assembly line style. Plastic gloved hands pluck out barbecue chicken, fried fish, 
scoop potato salad, droplets of bup and meh. Someone yells for another container of jajimi. The speaker warbles a keyboarded song. A child inevitably cries. Mine dances in the middle of the party. The MC shouts, the children are obstructing our view. Someone wheels a grandma onto the dance floor. The dance begin. Now here is a nice celebration of survival. Thank you. That's um, that is very powerful, um, and and incredibly evocative. Among other things, I'm hungry now, um, but um, um, what? look, I want to. We we're going to talk you and I for a few minutes before other people chime in with questions, and there's a few things I'd like you to do just to kind of set the st stage, for people. You as you said in that poem and in the introduction to it you're kind of required some of the time to be nice now. Um, that's literally what I guess diplomats do, <laughs> be diplomatic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, um, let's, let's, let's go back a little further back before climate change. Just remind mm. people for a little bit about mm. uh, the Marshallese um, uh, entanglement with the existential crisis of the 20th century, if you would, for a moment. Yeah, thank you um, for letting me highlight that. So a lot of so some people are aware and some people aren't. But the Marshall Islands has this relationship with the United States, and it's based off of after World War II, when the U.S. liberated us from Japanese and they um, closed off what became a trust territory, and the United States started testing and they tested sixty over sixty nuclear weapons in the, our islands. So one of which was the Bravo bomb, which is a thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. And the poison from that testing has continued on to today. There's um, an island called Bigini, which you can never go to, uh, um, we can't ever live at again because it's completely irradiated. Some islands were incinerated. And in fact, there is a nuclear waste site called the Runa Dome that is the perfect example of the intersection between climate change and nuclear issues because this nuclear waste site that's capped with a concrete dome is now leaking nuclear waste into the Pacific. And as the sea level rises, it's going to continue to you know, battle with that, with that waste and, and the cracks are gonna continue to develop because of it. So it's something, it's an issue that we've been trying to raise awareness on as well. So I think that's the existential kind of crisis. So when we're talking about climate change, the nuclear legacy really informs our um, how we plan for the future because we have already lost islands, basically. We've already lost islands. We know what it is to, um, to give, you know, continuously give for global needs, um, you know, because we were told this is to save for world peace when they told us in, initially on um, the US government. So. Yeah, that helps and that is definitely informing our climate future and how we plan moving forward. Now, since most of us are sitting a long ways from um, the marshals, or really from, I mean, there's really only a handful of people in the world who live on uh, atoll islands and in quite the same relationship with the sea. Just put your poet cap on for a minute. And just sort of describe for a minute, freeform almost, what it's like to live that close to the ocean. Now, forget climate change for the moment. Just, I mean, it's a, it's a powerfully uh, unique human experience to be that most of us don't have to be right on. What is that like? What does that do to your uh, mood, sense of the world? Um, how do, does the world feel small or big or what? It definitely reminds you, well, I so I spent a lot of time outside of the Marshalls because I went to college and high school out in the US. And so when I came back out here, the first kind of like visceral thing is it's just ocean, like all around you. And you realize how incredibly vulnerable we are um, when you think of it in context of climate change. But as like a daily life, you wake up, I open the doors, there's ocean. You just hear the sound of the waves immediately. It's just normal. And then um, you drive along to drop off your kid off at school. You pass over the bridge, ocean all over, all, all around the side of you. You pass the high school, um, there's a lagoon right there, like literally like right outside your door. It's like glass, you know, just this huge glass just right there. 
Um, and then, you know, every weekend is, oh, let's, let's have a picnic. Let's go to the small islands and have a picnic and we'll take a boat to the small island and have a picnic in this island where there's nobody else for an entire day, you know? So that's, I mean, it's just around you all the time and you, you, you get so used to it that the sound becomes background noise for you. And, um, yeah, so that's, and then there's some who are deeply involved in the ocean. They're fishermen they're divers um, and they engage as often as they can in the ocean. And then there's some that are a little bit more land-based. <laughs> <Like me. laughs> Terrestrial. So, yeah, just being honest, I do go picnic, but I don't like dive that deep or, and I don't fish that often, but you know, that's a, it's a normal part of life and we all know, and you know, eating the fish from the ocean. And there's so many words for a fish out here. It's crazy. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So now, so now, I mean, that's people have successfully lived uh, two meters above the ocean for thousands and thousands of years. Um, yeah. um, so now, talk about what it feels like to have. I mean, describe a king tide, maybe, and mm. and just. I mean, what kind of? Um, is there a kind of a, a, a apprehension that creeps into one's sense of the world or, or or what does it feel like i think it feels like uh a foreshadowing you know when you watch the movie and the scary thing happens and you're like oh no this isn't good you get kind of that bad feeling in your in your stomach that's what happens when you see king tide so king tide for those who don't know is there's king tide seasons and it's when the tides are season unseasonally high and mixed with other couple of other factors it'll result in a high tide being pushed all the way out into the, um, over the water, over our land. And sometimes in the past, it's displaced homes and dried out our crops. Um, and it also even brings with it a lot of trash, actually, unfortunately. So in the past, I remember the first king tide I ever experienced, it was just all this water all along our side of the roads. And we woke up in the middle of it, you know, like I woke up to it in the morning and me and my mom went out and it was just water and also trash and like people's homes like flooded all around us, all these neighbors. And it, it, I remember asking my mom, have you ever seen anything like this? Has this happened before? And she said, it's not happened this frequently. And it was just this like settling feeling of like, of fear, just real fear. You know, what does this mean for us? Yeah. I think this is um, an increasing part of the human condition now, the, um, you know the natural poets and uh, you know writers and dramatists and novelists used to mostly concentrate on writing about the um, conflicts between people because that's where most of the action was and the the natural world was a fairly stable backdrop to all of this you know um, um, but now I mean if you're in California there's fire season most of the year round and if you're living on the gulf of mexico there's hurricane season that stretches a lot longer than it used to and the same in place after place around the world and i think people are having to sort of start trying to just psychologically come to grips with that because i mean because it's wearing on you know i mean um, after a while to sort of be looking over your shoulder a little bit um, is, 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 well, it, it just takes a toll. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that there's still so much work needs to be done is understanding the mental health costs of climate change. And for those of us in the atolls, especially, I mean, we already don't have enough infrastructure or like we have bare minimum. There's like one therapist on island, licensed psychologist on island, literally, it's just one guy. And, you know, we have um, tried to incorporate that into our work with our youth. So, you know, every summer a climate and health arts seminar, and we talk about the intersections between climate and health. And one of them we talk about is mental health. And so we talk about mental health and how climate change can affect our mental health. And they actually, the kids actually paint and, and um, write poetry and write songs about it to sort of, it just gives them a moment to help them grapple with this issue, you know, and I think that's what, um, that's why I've, I've uh, so much of our nonprofit is focused on art is to help people process what's happening, at least give them that breathing space to not have the answers to not, you know, have to perform 
for anybody, but just to process it. Yeah. So I think you're right. It's it's something we we're having to think about now. These questions of attitude interest me immensely, and the questions are starting to come in from all kinds of people. So I'll get to them in just a minute. But oh, I've okay. One yeah, more sure. that, yeah. One more that I just want myself to thing to bring out. Um, um, I, I think that there's a, a tendency to have, and you sort of got at that in, 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 when you were describing the, sort of the, some of the conferences you're at and people telling you how brave you were and things. There's a kind of um, a tendency to have a, a, a sort of pity for uh, people. Oh, you know, but I've always been um, happily, uh, I, I, my, my favorite, uh, my favorite slogan in the entire climate fight is the one from the Pacific Climate Warriors. We're not drowning, we're fighting. So just yeah. talk about that spirit for a second, because it, 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 there's nothing that makes me uh, happier than that. Yeah, um, I love that saying too. Um, I remember, you know, that's been one of my favorite parts of working with 350 is, is the 350 Pacific team which is made up of really brilliant organizers and activists who come together and are very intentional about how they work with Pacific Islanders. So we're not tokenized in that space as like victims necessarily, or, you know, you know, and we're not victimizing ourselves. We're doing everything that we can to, you know, raise the sound, raise the alarm, and then also engage with our community members to, Come up with these solutions ourselves. So I totally agree with that saying, you know, we're not drowning, we're fighting. Um, I think some people still like struggle with it a little bit because um, it's so easy to just say uh, we're we're gonna drown and that's it, and to be completely lost in the in the sadness of that, you know, in the it's like a nihilistic thing. And, you know, especially when I hear from um, people who aren't from here who are like, well, that's it, there's nothing we can do. I'm like, really? You you give up. I don't I don't think you should be allowed to give up. I don't think you have that. You're not allowed to. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's something that we try to remind people over and over again from the Pacific is, yeah, we might be coming around, you know, like I said in my poem, um, feeling like, you know, this this like we're we're begging, you know, for support. But at the other side of it, it's not just that. I mean, we have amazing technical people here on the ground who are developing energy roadmap plans, you know, who are um, helping to communicate with our communities so they know what's happening, you know, and who are developing really interesting solutions and using nature-based solutions slash traditional knowledge to, um, uh, to plant our, our, our traditional plants as, as coastline, along our coastlines uh, as barriers, you know, we're, there's still so much knowledge out here. And I think people forget that, you know, that we're not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs and waiting for somebody to come in and save us. And I think that's what we always have to also initiate when we have these conversations is, yeah, give us funds, support us in what we need to do, but let us be in charge of how we engage on this issue. Because, you know, like I always say, we contributed pretty much nothing to the climate crisis. Like our global, our, our um, carbon footprint is is little to nothing. It's not, it's like 0.00001% of the world's global emissions. We shouldn't have to pay for any of what, of, of the changes that we need to make to our land to survive. So yeah, I think that's something that we always try to say is, you know, we're, we're fighting. So we're fighters, we're, we're scrappy. We're little, but we're scrappy. <laughs> Nicely put. Um, um, one of the um, the first first questions a really good one, and it brings us back okay. to to Greenland, and and um, and and I, I don't know whether you even remember. I don't know if you can remember all the words to that poem or not. But there is a beautiful mm -hmm. section in there where you're also listing some of the other cities of the world. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Someone asks, in the poem Rise, the people of Greenland are connected to the people of the Marshall Islands. But what's the best way to forge global solidarity? And it's very true that, that, that Greenland's another sort of victim of all of this. And the other challenge is to forge that solidarity with people in places that can do something about it, um, mm -hmm. that prevent it. That's why I love that section about the the cities in the in the rest of the world. I don't know. You you, you probably it's a lot to ask. Do you remember that? But just uh, talk about that larger question about forging solidarity. 
I actually think this is where the work of 350 and activism is so important and valuable. Like, yes, I definitely, uh, obviously I see the importance of diplomacy and making sure countries are aligned and, and having those kinds of conversations. But I will say like, I'm still friends with Akka, you know, my friend from Greenland. Me and Akka still message and shoot each other Instagram messages and funny memes that we see on the internet and catch up once in a while. And I understand Greenland's issues so much more deeper because of um, because of her. So I definitely think activism is is the best way, you know, is for for these global activists. So even though, you know, the COP has been critiqued really heavily, and all of these conferences have been critiqued really heavily, and I, I totally understand why, and it's it's valid. There's also these opportunities where there's people flying in from all over the world and activists are connecting outside of those spaces and they're learning about each other, they're learning about each other's histories and then they're forging these alliances and seeing those similarities and I feel like that can't, that shouldn't be downplayed, it's, it's, it's so valuable for understanding why, you know, um, how that kind of, it might also even connect at a higher level at some point and so I, I feel like that's Yes, I guess that's what I would say is I think what in terms of that line, it's actually more like, I think it's a bit a bit more negative. It's it's about like, let's watch as Miami, um, uh, I think was said Osaka, like, you know, try to breathe underwater. I, I We list exactly. a bunch of coastal cities and we say, let's watch as they try to breathe underwater. Because I think what we're trying to do is highlight how vulnerable all coastal cities oh, are, sure. not just. Um, yeah, not just Greenland and, and the Marshall Islands, but we were saying, yeah, they're they're the ones that are going to be hit next, and that's literally what's happening. We're seeing that happening right now. Yeah. Someone asks if you've ever met any resistance in the Marshalls or elsewhere in the Pacific to your climate activism. That's an interesting question, and I, 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 I bet there's a number of different places. I remember early on. In my own experience organizing the Pacific, it took a while to convince some of the um, sort of Christian religious establishment that there was anything to worry about here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have had that um, where other Marshallese have messaged me to say like, stop, um, what did he, one of them say? It was like, stop brainwashing our youth with this information, God will save us, like we're protected, you know, all of these and I was like, oh, I didn't engage. I didn't have the energy to engage, <laughs> but I don't usually engage. But and then just recently, though, this was kind of wild, actually. Um, there I was performing at this. Um, uh, so there's an island called Huayelen, which is the U.S. military base. Um, and it's one of our largest atolls. And so that's where the, you know, we have that relationship with the U.S. and they have a military base in, in, in our islands and it's called Guadalajara. And they have a high school there and a community and then a smaller island called Ibai nearby where all the Marshallese people live. And I went out and I, I was invited to go out and I've never been to that island or that base. I've read so much about it because I read a lot about military occupation too. And I went and performed for the students there. And a woman actually came to my first, my public performance. And then two days later to the school assembly and was like, I wrote a poem inspired by you. And it was a poem completely bashing me. <laughs> it was like line by line insulting me and saying like, she writes about an island she doesn't know. I don't see her culture in her words. And I don't think her, her methods will, will succeed. You know, basically saying that. And later as she was like getting escorted out because it was like a huge, I didn't, I, you know, I, I was okay. Like, I, I just was like, okay, let's try to diffuse the situation because there's a bunch of kids here and everyone was getting really upset. Um, so I didn't respond crazy, but I did hear later that she said, you know, she's pushing the liberal agenda and the kids deserve to hear otherwise. Cause I was talking about climate change and doing my poetry. So this was on Guadalajara, like real, right nearby. So I was like, wow. So that was interesting. And someone said, has this ever happened to you? I was like, has this, has anybody ever written a diss poem about me and read it in public? No. You've <laughs> so got your own later. beef now. <laughs> yes, I had my own. <laughs> that's so that's that a wild later. story. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask, have you, what's that? I'm sure you get pushed back all the time, though. But has, I would love to hear how you have dealt with it because you've, um, you've done it for so much longer and I feel like people yes. are even more interested with you. I've done it. I, so I, since I've been doing it for a very long time, I'm afraid I've gotten them. Um, I mean, I used to sort of uh, pay it. I, I get a lot of death threats and things. And, and uh, at the very beginning, a long time ago, I used to, you know, occasionally if one seemed bad, I'd call up the uh, police to say, should I be worried? And, 
at one point, some guy, one, some nice policeman said to me, um, said, yeah, the ones that write you aren't the ones that are going to shoot you. So I, so I, I didn't know whether, I didn't know whether that was good news or bad, <laughs> but, but it just sort of, uh, uh, it just sort of uh, said, okay, there's, there's a certain limit to what you can do about and worry about, and, you know, so one worries about one's family, but that's, you know, yeah. and I'm sure. How do you everyone, worry? Um, but it's, I, I haven't you know, gotten to your, yeah, I haven't gotten to your level of, of stardom at all. So no, I, it's, I, I think it's, death you know, and, 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 and uh, hopefully, we're, I mean, the United States is kind of crazy right now. So, yeah. you know, so, yeah. Sure. But that, that leads sort of this interesting, you know, next question that, 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 I mean, the questioner is how have you made the transition from, from writer to climate envoy? How do you find inspiration in the climate process, which I'm sure is full of bureaucracy and fluorescent lights and things? And that's a very good question. And a, and a sort of way of sharpening it too is to say, um, poets and writers use words in one way and diplomats and politicians use words often in a very different way. And there must be some sort of, there, there, I, I mean, I, I, I know I, I've, I, I'm not an official part of any of these processes. So there must be moments when it just feels very disjointed. Yeah. It's very difficult because there's been times when um, so a lot of my work has been like contributing to um, statements like official statements and you know like using that writing skill and so everybody will be like well you're a writer can you just write this letter this official letter and I'm like that's not the same thing. <laughs> Writing poetry and talking about my feelings isn't the same thing as writing a diplomatic note between, you know, two missions and stuff. So um, I think that's something is that people for people out here in the Marshalls, we're still learning about and um, they're still learning about those kinds of differences that writing doesn't necessarily mean one way. And so I think even though, yeah, we are writers as poets and, and as you know, and you're with your essays, um, I think the it's it's still pretty difficult, especially with the negotiations, because when you're coming up with language for inserting, you know, into um, the final cover decision, you know, at the COP, um, that's all legal speak. And so for me, I, I'm actually not there yet in really being good at that. That's still something I'm, I'm really having to learn and having to understand. Like someone recently told me about like, you know, um, what was it? Uh, it was someone who was much more experienced than me, and and he had, writ he had um, told me, oh, uh, if if these words are in the in the, you know, if they use these words, then it's it's so it's so it, it's bad, you know, decides, urges, requests. Like if they use that word, then in the um, what 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 would you call that bill? Like the in the final protocol. The yeah, 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 in the final like language. If they says decides, you know, urges or requests, and those are the, the weakest words that, and he was saying that, you know, that's in, and you I, have I to wouldn't say have known demands that. or, yeah, demand. Yeah, or, or something like that, you know? Or, yes. Yeah, but they said those ones are the least, um, the, not as strong. And so I ended up incorporating that into a poem um, just because it was helping me like process it a little bit. And I was like, wow, that's, those are the most boring words of my life. And I have, to, you have that poem and I have, Do you have that poem in your head? I, I do actually. I, well, I have the poem here. Yeah. So it's um it's called oh, so it's funny. Yeah. Read it. I'd I, love I, to hear it. Okay, but it's only three words. That those three words are only there real fast. But the re, it's I have to give some context to the piece. So the piece was written for um an art gallery, and it was talking about how whale, it was talking about the connection in the Pacific between military occupation and how it impacts the Pacific Islands. And so we, me and the artist I was collaborating with which was focusing specifically on whales and how whales have been affected by military sonars. And so right. I brought in climate change into that, the COP into that and tried to connect whales, sonars, Greenland and climate change. So we like want to hear this, kind of crazy. please. All right. <laughs> and then also some personal processing that I was going to. So it's called Beached. And if the documents are true, then even the whalers avoided us. They slid past these islands, whittled without rivers from gods living in shallow trunks of knee. Whales were hunted for the simplest pleasure, a light and meat. 
Greenlandic hands offer me whale the same way I am offered turtle back home, in tradition, in ceremony, how conquerors stripped the sacred, left a soured carcass of commodity, simple pleasures plundered and masticated. Destruction takes many forms. Persistent floods besiege us from all sides, even here in this meeting. We cross and crisscross an ocean of documents meant to charter an unfiltered future. Destruction takes the form of bolded words, decides, urges, requests. Three abysmal sounding lines for compassion. In August, whales die in Maui without Hawaiian hands to soothe them into soft darkness. If it was a Marshallese shoreline, the beached whales would signal a chiefly death harbingers of loss and damage, cost analysis of disemboweled paperwork. How do we decide the proper response to a room full of sharks in suits? They can smell the brown in our blood, the native in our speech. They offer thickets of false solutions, strategies without navigational aids. I spent the meeting searching for the simplest pleasures a light to guide the thin meat of my paper heart. I could interpret your movements less than our enemies on all sides. Over and over, I asked you to decide your position. I urged you to reassess your motivations. I stood naked as a shoreline, requesting the simplest pleasures. That's, That's <laughs> an amazing. That's an amazing poem. Um, um, I mean, that took, our friend, our friend Greta Thunberg memorably described the last uh, cop as blah blah blah, but that that took that and made that into. I mean, that image of a kind of sea of uh, of documents crossing a sea of documents and the kind of bolded declarations and things is. I think they should. I think they should have to read that before the start of every UN meeting of any kind. I think things would be much improved. Um, um, that's really something. Someone asks, and this is a good question. Um, um, yeah. Do you find it hard to negotiate with or, or trust countries like the US, um, given the history of the Marshalls and given where we stand now on climate change, and uh, US and plenty of others? Um, um, I, I mean, the Marshalls are not in a position to um, dictate. <laughs> um, and I think because you lack an army and, uh, you know, all the other things that, but, and so you have no choice to, but to trust, work with, whatever. But the, uh, the psychological yeah. toll of that's got to be, price of that's got to be fairly high. I think it, it can be difficult for us Marshallese, um, especially knowing all that history. Uh, we actually have something called the High Ambition Coalition, which is uh, a coalition of you know high level states, you know, and it, it brings together um, states who who say they have high ambition on climate change, and um, you know because the U the U S was actually a part of the original High Ambition Coalition, and they actually ended up leaving after Trump. Um, and so when President Biden came back in, uh, Secretary Kerry immediately became a part of the High Ambition Coalition once again. And so we do have regular conversations with them about, you know, uh, making sure that we highlight all of the issues and we we all, we're always kind of through this coalition um, negotiating with these other nations who are, you know, more high emitting nations, but they're also the more uh, wealthier nations. And it includes other small countries too, not just the Marshalls, but we actually chair it. And so it, it you know, on the one hand, you know, um, it allows us, it allows them to sort of have this pat on the back that we're a part of this coalition that's amazing and that's you know includes countries like the Marshall Islands. So we're doing the best that we can do. But then on the other the, the other side, um, you know, it allows us to have that seat at the table. So whereas a lot of people will critique the COP in you know, these UN spaces because of how much these larger nations control the dialogue. For us as a smaller nation, you know, we have a seat at the table. That can't, that's not a small thing at all, actually, to be able to voice our concerns and to actually even lead in some ways, in very savvy ways, um, and, and, and influence some of the conversations. 
So I think it, it, there are times when it's been really difficult. And I think you know about the last COP where I think it was three nations went in and watered down some of the language at the last minute. That was really, for me, an eye-opener. Like, man, how do we, you know, how, how effective is this space for us as Pacific Islanders if that's going to happen at the last minute? And so I always, you know, I have been open about my feelings about that and discussing it with the Pacific Islands Forum. Like, how do we hold those kinds of, you know, events accountable and, and keep note of that because that influences the space of negotiations. If, you know, so I, I guess I, I don't have an easy answer for that. That's just something I'm still kind of grappling with myself. Yeah, it's difficult. It's a, it, it's beautifully put. I've made you talk uh, so much about. Um, all this global work. So let's talk locally again. Someone has a good question sure. here. Someone says, mm -hmm. thank you for reading such a beautiful poem that emanates heart and place and community. In an era of globalized hegemonic culture and economy, how might you imagine a, a, a relocalization and greening and possible degrowth of production along with the the reinvigoration of localized art and writing that reflects the geography and culture of a place. I mean, you wrote the first published book of poetry, I think, that ever came out of the Marshall Islands. Um, 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 uh, but, but the, and, and it's incredibly wonderful that you've had this voice that's been heard at the UN and around the world. And I, I makes me extraordinarily happy. And at the same time, the the greatest pleasure of writing, I think, is to speak to the people right around you too. Um, a very localized um, um, thing. Um, so talk about that a little bit, localization and globalization of culture, because you're both a, a, a local writer and a very, uh, almost unprecedentedly global one too. Yeah, I think um, I'm in kind of a really unique position where I technically have three jobs, <laughs> but as con climate envoy and then director of the nonprofit and then pursuing uh, my current PhD. But the with doing the like um, the nonprofit work, it really grounds me, you know, because then I have to come back and figure out how do I teach these young people around me what loss and damage is, you know, how do we translate um, this thematic issue that's becoming really like vote, like really loud at the international level, loss and damage. What does that look like on the ground here? Right. So we have to, we have to figure that out like right now. And it's, I think that's really the difficult part about climate change is that there's constantly new science coming in and there's new ways of thinking. And then there's all these negotiations happening at the international level. And it's like, we're building a boat as it's sinking. Like that's what it feels like we're doing. We're just trying to figure out how to throw together the boat. So, you know, I've always said this, like, it feels like for a while we were pushing mitigation, mitigation, mitigation. Everyone needs to lower their emissions. Then we realized it's not happening fast enough. We got to protect ourselves. We got to start thinking about adaptation. And now we're like, okay, adaptation, adaptation and mitigation. And then now we're like, wait a minute, we're losing parts of our islands already. We got to talk about loss and damage now. So it's like, it constantly feels for me, at least very much like we're just like trying to keep up and trying to run alongside everybody. And I think, um, yeah, and I think living here and it's, it's been really important that I live here, you know, and being a part of the community means understanding you know, that you have to translate all of that information so that it's understandable to just the common person, my aunt who helps, you know, at my house. Um, I, my friend, Susan Gieda, who's a master weaver, I need to be able to communicate to her what we're doing out there. Um, so I think that that's the part that can be really difficult. And, you know, there's national level work and then there's nonprofit youth work. And that even that has its own you know, step down in different kind of form of engagement. Yeah. So well, one last question. I'll stop question. there because I know. One last question yeah. I want to get in before we finish. I know we're almost up against time, but you've done all this work okay. with youth, um, youth organizing. Now, that's been the absolute center of uh, climate, the climate fight in recent years is young people. Um, yeah. And it's mostly who I've worked with over my life at 350 and elsewhere. But now I'm trying to organize old people like me. Um, Which I love. I love um, that. Do you have any advice? I, I have a feeling that uh, there may be cultures 
outside America where we have a stronger conception of what elders might be capable of. Any advice from life in the marshals? Well, to be transparent, elders are the ones leading our country. I mean, most of the senators here are in their 60s to 70s. Um, and they're the ones that are the one, you know, and, and, and for us, like, even though I'm in my 30s, and, you know, to some people that would seem like adult, but I, when I'm around these statesmen, I'm still treated like, you know, like a lot younger, because our culture is very much rooted in age. Um, and we're very, re we recognize age more so than a lot of things like it's like, uh, even if you might have done um, amazing things, a lot of the thinking is you're still too young to be making those decisions and to be the one leading that kind of thing. Yeah. So for us, it's really stratified. So I, I you know, for the work that you're doing, I, I love that you're engaging with older people because I do feel like the youth climate movement has come up and it's become this like beautiful force. But then it's like, what do these people who, you know, I'm, I'm like aging out. I don't count myself as youth. I'm youth adjacent. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I don't, you know, what, we're, all what does headed, that mean we're all headed that? in the same direction eventually, Kathy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know, because I, I've noticed the U.S. isn't like that. They don't, I feel like they don't respect elders in the same way we do, um, where they're not, you know, they're, yeah, they don't. There's not enough respect towards elders, I've, I've always felt about in, in American culture. And in Pacific Islander culture, it's real heavy. You really respect your elders. So with you all, hmm, you're gonna, yeah, you're not all right. working I'm, with that same school. I'm, yeah. I'm coming Sorry. for a visit soon to get some pointers. That's, <laughs> um, Kathy, this has been the best hour of the week for me. I can't thank you enough for oh, really all nice. the work that you do and all the, you're a constant, constant inspiration to us. And, and, and to have those poems, and I, I will just say, if there's anybody in this audience who hasn't yet gotten to listen to Rise in particular, it's easy to find on the internet. Um, and it is, mm -hmm. it, it not only is the poem amazing, but the video that people put together of it is extraordinarily beautiful. And, and um, I, I think if there's one document of the poetic document of the climate era, uh, that for me is it. So we owe you an enormous debt and we owe the good people at Perry House a great debt for letting us talk this afternoon. And I, I think, LaShawn, we're back to you. you. Such such thanks. Well, thanks. Thanks to both of you. That was really wonderful. Um, Bill, I think this was also the, you know, one of the greatest highlights of my day. Um, I saw I've, I've become familiar with your poetry, Kathy, through this process and moved by it um, and am even more moved by it when I hear you reading it. Um, I feel like part of what was achieved today was to remind our audience that, that SIDS, SIDS as a group of countries um, is a, are places of abundance and creativity, mm. but abundance, not just need. And that, that abundance is in fact um, worth saving and all is not lost. And that there are cultures and practices um, that are worth saving, not just because they have something to teach the rest of us, but because they're worth saving uh, because of what they offer in and of themselves, actually. They are completely mm -hmm. with merit. So thank you for joining us uh, today and for rounding out our program. It's been really wonderful. I would also thank the audience for joining us for this final keynote event of our 2022 Global Shifts Colloquium. Bill, you were a masterful moderator. So thank you also for doing that. Um, we're very proud to have hosted this discussion on the intersections of climate change and culture under the umbrella of our Global Shifts Colloquium, Islands on the Climate Frontline, Risk and Resilience. This event overall looked at the impacts of climate change through the lens of countries that are most vulnerable, the most affected, small island developing states. We were able to learn more about what can be done to prepare and what the world needs to do to help those who are most susceptible to global environmental crisis. There's much work to be done, of course, and we encourage all of you to be involved and to take direct action. Thank you for joining us this afternoon and be well wherever you find yourself. Bye-bye. <laughs>